All right, welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green, bringing you brand new interviews right here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe, go down into the description, click on the Patreon link, become a member of the channel, all those cool things. It's not every day that you have a guest that uh, you, you admire and that, uh, that you've wanted to have on the show for quite some time. I would say that Rod Morgenstein, in my opinion, is one of the greatest living drummers uh, of all time. And not just my opinion, but many others as well. Not only is he an incredible drummer, but he's also one of the kindest people uh, that you'll meet. In the short time that I worked with Winger, one of my favorite uh, parts of the, the job, besides the music, was to, one, watch Rod play uh, every night when Rod plays. If you're on one of these cruises or festivals, all the drummers converge behind his drum set to watch him play uh, the end of Headed for a Heartbreak. And uh, it's, it's become a thing. You, you look around, you see them all. Uh, so that, and then also hearing Rod tell me some of these amazing stories. Uh, if anyone should have a book, it's Rod Morgenstein. His life is filled with a colorful cast of characters. We'll talk about some of them. Uh, and also I should point out Winger 7, brand new music available everywhere right now. We'll talk about all those things and more right after this. Here he is, Rod Morgenstein. Hey, Jason, how are you? Good to see you, Rod. Nice to see you too. It was great to see you on the Monsters of Rock cruise, which I'm not sure what number cruise that was for Winger. Might have been six or seven. I was with you guys on the first one, 2014. Ah. Uh, and uh, and I can tell you, everyone was sort. Of, we were all learning cruise etiquette and 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 how you communicate without a phone uh, and all these. It was new to everybody. That I remember, and I remember the first time we had to fly on a private plane. Chuck Brennan had a plane to go from New Mexico to Las Vegas, and I, I didn't want to do it. And Paul Taylor didn't want to do it. He didn't want to do it so much. He rented a car, and drove. I said, if this plane should go down, it's the tomorrow. It's going to be Paul Taylor's winger. He'll be the only one um, <laughs> to, to, to make it. And I said to myself, though, uh, these guys must do this all the time. These winger guys are probably used to this. And to which I learned that was not the case. Reb was so nervous. Uh, he asked the pilot, you've done this a few times before, right? <laughs> so, all right. Reb is a nervous flyer. Paul is a nervous fly. I can remember way back on the first or second album, um, we were headed, we flew to a city of which there are two cities with the same name, you know, like Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, um, why can't I think? <laughs> Kansas City. Missouri. Is in, yeah, Missouri, thank you very much. And so we went to the wrong city, and the only way that we could make it in time for the show was to go to general aviation and you know hire a private plane to get us there mm -hmm. and so the five of us with our tour manager rick fulner get in this little turboprop plane uh, of which i've flown hundreds of times in the dixie dregs steve morse is a pilot um and so the other guys not so much and paul and red being nervous um didn't help matters but paul is also afraid of bees and then once we were airborne, it turns out that there's a bee buzzing around the plane. And there's only so much, um, you know, uh, cockpit space in in a six, eight, an eight seater plane. You know, it's tiny. You're on top of each other. And so uh, that had some harrowing moments. But I'm yeah. I'm fine in, in small planes. I love them uh, because of my hundreds and hundreds of times flying over the years. Uh, with Steve and the dregs, and uh, I feel safer in a small plane, especially a prop plane, than a jumbo jet, because if a jet loses its engines, you don't have too many options. But in a small plane, without an engine, it can coast for a long time while you kind of suss things out and figure out where to land. And a small plane can land anywhere. It's only coming down at, I, I don't know specifically, but what? 80 miles an hour where a jet's coming down at like what one something you know yeah uh, it's, 
The amount of airports that I've seen you in, Rod, no one has worse luck with flights than you, especially at the winter. I would have a flight back to Vegas at, you know, 8 p.m. and you'd have a 7 a.m. flight. I'd get to the airport and still see you sitting there because snow and storms and all these things. So the amount of time you spend in airports, I could imagine that flying private isn't such a bad thing. It's not so bad. And it's especially beautiful at night. For some reason, there's no wind at night. It's calm. The stars are out. You know, you go above clouds if there are clouds and you really feel like you're in heaven. It's nice. Yeah. You just, the problem is Paul and Reb are scared that they're, they're going to get to heaven uh, <laughs> flying <laughs> those planes. But, um, well, there's so, there's so much to talk about, and the winger dynamic is always fascinating. The personalities in that band are, are incredible. But well, let's, let's get to those guys. Rod, you know, I'm not a drummer, but I'm, I, I, I appreciate your playing so much, and I think a lot of people do as well. One of the things that I've always said when I watch you play is the way you choose the parts, the type of music that winger makes. Uh, people might think your peers, your playing is very different than that. And so I think it attracted people in a lot of ways. Of course, people knew you from the Dixie Dregs. They knew you were an accomplished musician. But to see you apply that to the genre of uh, 80s hard rock, I think goes a long way. So I want to go back and figure out how you got there. Um, mm -hmm. You started, you're a New Yorker, as myself, and you started playing piano first, right? Yes. Um, my parents enrolled me in the cultural workshop. And uh, I forget exactly what age I was, but probably five or six or seven. My first instrument was the piano, but I had no interest in it. And it was not that many years later. I think before, just before my 11th birthday, the Beatles played on the Ed Sullivan show. And my parents and sister and I were just huddled around watching this, all of it, us uh, enjoying it immensely. You know, my sister and I, of course, were in awe. And I knew in that moment that I wanted to be a musician. And for whatever reason, I was identifying with the drumming and Ringo Starr. Never looked back. It's, um, you, you know, I can't tell you how many times I hear that almost exact story about family sitting in front of the TV and somebody saying, you know what, this is what I want to do. You, 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 the people told me you can hear the other TVs in the building. You can hear everybody tuning in. Uh, and a lot of amazing musicians probably came out of that uh, that same moment. So when do you start playing drums? Uh, maybe a couple of months before my 11th birthday. So I watched the Beatles and said to my family, I want to play the drums. And so immediately my parents uh, uh, took me to Manny's Music in New York City. Mm -hmm. and uh, got me a bass drum and a snare drum. And back then, this is way before technology started doing all the cool things that have been done with drums, you know, in the last 50 some odd years. Just had a little telescoping cymbal stand and it came with a 10 inch cymbal, which I still own. Wow. One of my, one of my you know, treasured mementos. So, um, so they bought me a bass drum snare with the cymbal just to see if uh, it would hold my interest long enough to where then they'd consider then getting me a ride cymbal, then a hi-hat, then a rack tom, then a floor tom. And, uh, you know, so I never lost interest in it. And, you know, here I am, whatever, you know, 60, 60 years later. Yes. Years, you know, yeah. years later. But, you know, fast forward from when I saw the Beatles, uh, probably eight or ten years later, uh, I had a renewed interest in the piano. And when I went to college, uh, I I was even though I auditioned on piano on drums, uh, they allowed me to take lessons at the University of Miami in Florida with the jazz piano teacher, and that opened up a whole new world for me. Well, before we even get to University of Miami, I want to know you're a lefty. You write left-handed, you play left-handed. At what age did you realize that maybe you were a little different than the other drummers? Right, so uh, when I got the bass drum and snare drum and the cymbal, uh, and then little by little started putting a drum set together, I just sort of followed the picture or the pictures of how Ringo played. So I set up a right-handed drum set and um, I, you know, I didn't immediately start taking private drum set lessons, maybe a year later, 
uh, my parents hooked me up with a local uh, big band teacher by the name of Howie Mann, who was a wonderful player and teacher. But he immediately saw that I was favoring my left hand. And it was he who turned me around. So it was very awkward at first because I'd been playing right-handed for a year. Uh, but it was on his recommendation. And back then, uh, you didn't have drummers like um, Billy Cobham and Simon Phillips and others who are left-handed, who play on right-handed kits, but they don't do this. They play open-handed. That's a like a technical topic. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I, I'm sure there's a lot of people tuning in who are uh, technical uh, uh, fans as well. So you you start play you play left-handed, and I always talk to other left-handed drummers about when you're starting out and you have to share backline and you're playing on these things. It can sometimes be a, a little bit of a pain, right? It's the worst thing in the world. It's one of the reasons why I um, I tend to shy away a lot from going out to see live music because if somebody wants me to sit in, I think of every reason to say no. And, um, I, you know, I've sometimes been forced into situations where I've had to sit in. The drummer is right-handed. And of course they say, hey, we'll switch it around. Just take a sec. And then we're trying to switch it around. And then, you know, inadvertently one or two of the, the musicians are going, hey man, how long is this going to take? And all of a sudden it's on me when I was asking to not have to sit in. Um, one of the most harrowing sitting in moments that I can remember is uh, when I was making the trek back and forth, forth from Long Island teaching in Boston at Berkeley College of Music for the 20 years I did it. Um, I got a phone call from a girl friend named Janet, who at the time was dating Greg Allman. And she said, hey, Ron, are you in Boston? I said, I am. In fact, I just finished teaching. She said, well, the Allman brothers are playing down the street from you. Uh, would you like to come to the show? So I said, sure. So I went to the theater. I know some of the people in the Allman Brothers Band. My friend Janet brought me in, and then it was time for the band to do their first of two sets. And they were nice enough to just put a chair on the stage for me so I could watch the show on, on the stage. So the band, you know, does like an hour and a half or however long they play. Great set. They took a break. I went back to chat with some of them during their break. And then I went and took my place in the chair for the second set. And when they came out to take their positions, one of the drummer, drummers, Jamo, is walking up the steps to his riser and he turns to me and he says, what song are you sitting in on? Okay, now, Jamo plays right-handed. I've not played in cover bands really since I'm a teenager, right? For like, from the day I got out of college, it was the Dixie Dregs and then, you know, most everything that I do is original music. Yeah. And um, so I've heard most of the Allman Brothers music, but I don't know how their songs start, how they end, and the little specifics of what goes on during the song. So um, I looked at the set list, I said, uh, how does Hotlanta go? And he hummed a couple of bars. I said, okay, I'll sit in on Hotlanta. So now it's the middle of the set. Jamo comes walking down. He hands me his drumsticks. And as I'm walking up the riser, you know, dreading having to play on a right-handed drum set, they're not letting me turn it around. Um, Jamo's drum tech, whose name is also Jamo, says, dude, dude, forgot to tell you, in the middle of the song, you and Butch Trucks do a drum solo. <laughs> yeah. Great, great. Um, and to the musicians watching, to the school musicians who are watching, they might find this next comment funny. He said, in the middle of the song, when you do the drum solo, you trade sixes, threes, and ones. Well, as far as I know, there's no such thing as sixes, threes and ones. So um, so I said to him, please tell me Butch goes first. And he said, yeah, Butch goes first. I said, great. Okay, so I'll, 
I'll figure out what a six, three and a one is when Butch plays. And then when he stops, I will have been counting measures to see what was meant by sixes. And it really was fours, fours, twos and ones. But the reason he said sixes, threes and ones, that's how they refer to it. It's because the song is in six. No one filled you, yeah, no one fills you in until you get up there. It, it's amazing an accomplished musician like yourself now has to guess what uh, what what universe they've created. Uh, and then to play on a right-handed drum set. At first, I sat down on the kit like a right-handed player would and then loosened the wing nut on the hi-hat so it would be closed. The song started. That wouldn't, it didn't work out. So then I turned to my right and straddled Jamo's floor tom so my left foot could play the bass drum. And then I had to turn my body kind of, you know, dramatically to the left to be able to do it. But, you know, it makes for a, a fun story. So it, it, makes any, for a, yeah, it makes for a great story, even if it might have been a little harrowing at the time. Yeah, yeah. So going back, who recommended University of Miami to you? All right, so my first two years uh, of college were at a community college about a half hour from where I grew up called Nassau Community College. And uh, I had an arranging teacher. I was majoring in music. For the for the two years, um, when when the second year was winding down, he asked me if I had plans to continue uh, and get my undergraduate degree. And I said, I am, but I don't know where to go. And he said, Oh, you should go to the University of Miami. I said, I hadn't even thought of it. Why would would I go there? He said, Well, he went there and said they had a great jazz, a contemporary jazz music program. So that's why I went to the University of Miami, um, just because a mentor suggested it. So I went down there, but as I mentioned before, I wasn't so sure if maybe I want to switch over and become a jazz piano player. And they allowed me to take improvisation classes and private jazz piano lessons. And so I was in Jazz Improv 101, and I was one of maybe three piano players, but there were a dozen guitarists and all but one of them played a fat hollow body Gibson guitar with all the treble off playing these jazz lines from the jazz book that all of us were studying out of patterns for jazz. One guitarist had more of a trebly twangy sound and he, he didn't play a fat hollow body Gibson. He played a beat up Fender Telecaster with four pickups. He had long blonde hair and the teacher was always yelling at him because he didn't sound like a bebop guitarist. And that was Steve Morse. Um, I had never spoken to him, but I was admiring him. And one day he came over to me and said, Hey, somebody told me you play the drums. Can you fill in for my drummer who is a surfer and he hurt himself surfing? So I said, sure. And when I went to that rehearsal, I, I really felt like I had died and gone to heaven um, because it was the Dixie Dregs. My favorite band at the time was called the Mahavishnu Orchestra. The Dixie Dregs were doing, you know, a couple of Mahavishnu cover songs. And, uh, and then the Steve Morse compositions just took me to another place emotionally. Um, look at that. Yeah, That's well, awesome. This that's is a little a, later. Yes, that's a later version of the band. Uh, so funny that I mentioned the Mahavishnu Orchestra, which really to date is uh, the band that probably had more of an influence on me than any other band, certainly uh, in terms of me becoming a fusion drummer, like jazz, rock, fusion. And um, I, I used to go see the Mahavishnu Orchestra as much as I could. In that photograph, second from left is the violinist from the Mahavishnu Orchestra, Jerry Goodman, who is one of my idols, who I used to go as a young, you know, as a teenager and like 20 year old, uh, marveling at the feats that this band pulled off. And so who who would have thunk that, uh, so, you know, 25 years later, one of the members of that band, who all of us in the Dixie Dregs idolized, um, would join up with us and play it's with us. 
pretty, yeah, it's pretty amazing. The, the, the beginning of Dixie Dregs, uh, and here, here's a band that plays instrumental jazz music, you, 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 and then achieves uh, a wider success. 1975, the record The Great Spectacular comes out. That's, uh, and that's an independent record, right? You guys made it yourself. Yeah. Yes, we did it at the University of Miami. So the year that some of us graduated, um, they had built a state-of-the-art concert hall on the campus, and it included a 24-track recording studio, and we were the first group of musicians to make use of that recording facility. And so we recorded 10 songs, uh, that um, we pressed a couple of thousand albums, called it The Great Spectacular, which is one of the songs on the album. And we used that album to shop for a record deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm sure original copies of that record are pretty valuable now. They, they're very valuable because uh, more than half of them melted in the back window of a car. <laughs> one of us had put them up there and then they were completely destroyed. So there's probably only a few hundred copies of that album available. Um, a lot of those songs ultimately ended up on future uh, commercially released albums. Right. On, on Capricorn and Arista. There was uh, some of the stories that we talked about. What I, one of the things I love about your playing and also your approach to playing is that you're open-minded to all styles of music. Maybe that wasn't always the case. Maybe you were a little bit more of a jazz snob or so, as you may have said. But uh, you tell you told me a story about seeing the Sex Pistols. Uh, was that when you were in college? No. Uh, when did the Sex Pistols play America? Was it 76, maybe? Probably 77, 78. 77. Okay, so I, I got out of college in 1975. And then um, the first year uh, out of college, I was living in a in a city called Evans, a little town outside of Augusta, Georgia. So this transplanted New Yorker, you know, living in bum F, uh, Georgia. And then um, about a year into it, when the Dregs, Dixie Dregs, got our first record deals, uh, you know, it was a banned vote. Most of us didn't want to stay there. We wanted to move to the big city. So most of us moved to Atlanta. And so in 1977, uh, I remember all the hoopla going on with the Sex Pistols. And just like you said a moment ago, I was a, a music snob, right? I wasn't listening to rock music at all. I thought it was Neanderthal, which is very, very close-minded. Um, and the Dixie Dregs used to play a lot of the places around Atlanta. One of them being the great Southeast Music Hall. And when I saw that the Sex Pistols were playing, was it their first US show? It was the, in Atlanta? It might've been the very first show. Um, um, you know, my girlfriend and then eventually wife, Michelle and I, we just drove up to the great Southeast Music Hall, knocked on the door. There were so many people, you know, out and about trying to get in there, but it was way beyond sold out. But someone who worked at the facility knew me and snuck the two of us in. You know, we had no right taking the seats from people who truly were lovers of punk music. I, you know, I just, I was like Beavis and Butthead, you know, those looks on their faces in the cartoon. Mm -hmm. um, watching this band playing what they called music. You know, now, now I, I've come to appreciate everything. Yeah. You know, music doesn't have to be complex to where you don't understand it until you listen to it a dozen times. Uh, as long as kind of like it moves you, who cares what it is? So um, it was a great experience seeing them and just seeing, uh, you know, how captivating um, four guys playing this insane three chord music um, could keep an audience. It's mind blowing to me. You you told me as a young person that you thought maybe you, you thought it was a joke. You thought maybe they, this was like they were putting this on. This can't be real. Right. True. True. Yeah. Which I th I think a lot of people might have uh, uh, thought that. 
But it's so funny that you went to see something that was in its, you know, uh, punk is in its infancy, and but there was this hype, the explosion in America, and you're going to see what it's all about, and uh, and it's totally it, it's insane, you know, and you wouldn't imagine that you would be telling that story, you know, this many, you know, forty years later. Yeah, right. Well, uh, you know, a similar but different thing happened in terms of me not having a right to be there, experience. Um, you know, sometimes we would have music, the radio on in our house. And so the rock station at the time was called 96 Rock in Atlanta. And uh, the DJ said the 96th caller will win two free tickets to tonight's concert of Ozzy Osbourne and Aerosmith at the Omni. So Michelle just picked up the phone, dialed the number, and they said, you're the winner. Okay, so that night, she and I went to this arena and turns out we saw Randy Rhodes in his last performance on last day on earth. Right. So again, here I was a, this fusion snob, you know, among 15,000 people clamoring for at the time, again, with my attitude, you know, the way I, I described Ozzy Osbourne, who all I knew was Iron Man. Right. That's all I knew of Ozzy Osbourne and Black Sabbath. And again, being a schooled musician, um, the song Iron Man has a riff and the words follow the riff. So there's not even two different parts going on. It's just uh, 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 uh. like it was so beyond stupid to me then. Mm -hmm. I love it now. OK, so like there was a transformation for me about. 10 years into my career. But here we were, you know, watching Ozzy Osbourne with this phenomenal young guitarist uh, on stage with him. And then the next day we heard the news. Crazy. Yeah. To, it, to experience such a historic event, it's, it's, uh, it, it's crazy to look back. I'm jumping, uh, jumping around a little bit. You've got sure. so much to talk about it. I don't want to keep you all day. But 1983, you go to tour with the Steve Morse band. Dixie Dregs takes probably its first hiatus uh, for a little while. And you, you tour with, of all bands, Rush. <laughs> I was, it was, um, if, if memory serves me correctly, it was November, December of 85 okay. and then and January of 86, something like that. Yeah, we did um, uh, 45 shows with them. Rush would never go out more than three weeks at a time. We're a very family-oriented band. And even though they had 40 some odd people on the road with all these tractor trailers and buses, after three weeks of shows, they send everybody home for 10 days. It's really uh, what a humane way of traveling. So um, it was clearly a life changing experience for all of us. For me in particular, you know, a drummer needs to imagine. Um, how many opportunities do they have to play drums in, in an arena where a significant number of the audience happens to be drummers? They're all air drumming. Have you been to a Rush concert? Sure, yeah. It's, a, that's, it's right. It's one of the rare times where the drums is the center. The center. And so after that tour, um, you know, three or four months later in Modern Drummer magazine, you know, they have the drum pole. And uh, I won Best New Talent in 1986. And it's 100%, at least in my mind, the result of us playing all of those shows in front of Rush, being Neil Peart's opening act drummer. The yeah, uh, standing. And uh, all three of them, stand-up guys, really wonderful. And, uh, you know, I got to be qu you know, quite friendly with Neil and, and Getty Lee. I would throw baseball with Getty Lee in the arena during the day. He's a big baseball fan. And during that period, you know, Neil Peart, who was one of the most extraordinary human beings in terms of these endless interests that he had, not just playing drums in Rush and being the lyricist, but at the time he was an avid bicycle rider. And right after that tour, he took his bicycle to China with a group of cyclists and for several weeks, they rode their bicycles through remote parts of China. And then 
about a year after that, I received a, a book in the mail. This was the beginning of Neil's literary career where um, he didn't ca carry a camera with him, just a pad and a pencil or a pen. And every day he would write about his experiences. And then when he got back from this bicycle tour, he wanted to experience what it would be like to write his first book to where, you know, he didn't just write it, but like he, he did every aspect of it, like picking the type that, that the words would be in and, and the thickness of the cover and the kind of cover. And, and uh, it, it was astounding. And so somewhere in my house, I have a signed copy um, of that first work of his that I think probably came out in 87, 1987. Wow. Yeah, incredible and a priceless thing. Now, obviously, he was, he was an incredibly private person. Even then, as his career went on, I think he became more private. Did you talk about drums or did you talk about what was it like? Oh, yeah, he's a, he was a very, very interesting and smart person. Yeah, no, we were talking about all kinds of things. And then, interestingly, um, my wife, Michelle, uh, would come out on the road and then she and Neil... Uh, would usually get into uh, very interesting conversations that would sometimes get heated in a good way, in a nice, fun way to where, you know, they had differences of opinion. Um, so that was really, really nice. Yeah, that's uh, these experiences, you know, we talk about them now. When you're living in that moment, you know, I mean, it's exciting. But to realize now that Neil is gone and that not that many people would have had that opportunity, especially as a drummer and still an up and coming drummer, I guess you had been playing for a long time, but to be in front of those people every night on that stage. Um, you know, I'm going to go back a little bit because before we go to uh, New York City in the beginning of Winger, I, as I said, you, uh, is there any plans of you writing a book? You know, I, I think of it now and then. And when I'm telling some of the really colorful stories, you know, it'll cross my mind. And if I'm telling someone a story, they'll say, why don't you blah, 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 blah. Um, it, it's a thought. Uh, you know, you can't help but amass really, really great memories um, when you play in a band and travel the world and, and record. Um, it's very different than, you know, traditional regular life. Yeah, well, colorful is the segue that I needed to get to Jaco Pistorius, um, <laughs> one of the most unique characters talked about, uh, documentaries, you name it. You have a, a, a several uh, personal experiences. Tell me a little bit about him. Well, all right. So uh, when I went to the University of Miami, um, in the student in the the music department student body you know you don't know uh who is going to actually go on and have careers of various sorts so like in this department of a of a hundred or two hundred students we had pat metheny the other members that became part of the pat metheny group he's one of the most famous jazz guitarists today still um uh bruce hornsby and the range most of his band were all students there and the Dixie Dregs. And then there was this like zany, kooky local bass player who wasn't a student, but he would just hang out in our, you know, little uh, um, mini campus as part of the big campus, you know? And that was Jaco Pistorius. They might have hired him to actually give some bass lessons because he was clearly. Um, not only from another planet, he was on another level of playing and, uh, you know, um, music genius. Um, and so when the dregs would play Florida in years to come, on occasion, Jocko would show up and then he would sit in with us. And, uh, you know, he was, he was always uh, colorful. There's that word again. Um, but the last time any of us saw him was not that many days before he passed away when he was beat up in a in a nightclub by the bouncers because he was, I don't know what he was doing, causing some sort of fracas, you know. Um, he came up, did the song with us, and, uh, you know, our bass player who was the spokesman said, all right, ladies and gentlemen, Jocko Pistorius, thanks, Jocko, it was awesome. 
and he didn't want to leave the stage. So he just wanted to continue doing a bass solo. And so we all just kind of sat there in our concert, you know, watched him do his amazing thing. He might have been doing America the Beautiful, the Jimi Hendrix Woodstock version. And then when he had his fill, he unplugged his bass, jumped off the stage, ran out of the club. And then the next thing we heard a week or two later, he was gone. Yeah, it's it's sad. And I think that um, any of these legends who pass away and mysteriously the the folklore becomes more and more. But these were the type of guys, some of these guys that you played with, T. Lavitz, a few of these uh, other personalities, you would hear stories. One day they had gear, one day they didn't. Um, they, 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 the, the folklore of these people, you know, Jocko didn't have a bass or he would sell it one day or you know, uh, you, you've, you've experienced so many of those things with those characters. You know, um, uh, in, in our travels, we, we did a concert, I think it was at Tulane University, and Jocko had a band that, you know, played with us. Um, a very famous musicians, Peter Erskine on drums, and uh, um, um, one of the Brecker brothers, um, on Randy Brecker on trumpet, just amazing band. And I remember Jocko had his hair like in a, in a bun, like an, and looked very Asian because it was pulled back tight. And uh, either he told us or one of the guys in the band had told us, yeah, he, he was in, uh, I don't know if he was in China or Japan for a while. And, and in one crazed night, he just threw his bass in the ocean, you know, like crazy, crazy stuff. Yeah. Well, that's a, uh... And, and there's there's so many more of these type of stories. We'll let you save some of them for the book. But so talk about somebody who has a, a completely different career. You have two completely different careers. You probably have more than that. But we talk about jazz and we talk about um, the Dixie Dregs, the Steve Morse band, all these people. And then in 1986, you moved to New York City and your career is about to uh, do a complete change. Tell yeah. me about Winger. OK, so, um, you know, it was 11 years out of college, um, whenever anybody starts a band, you think that's going to be your job for the rest of your life. But you know, it doesn't really work out that way unless you're in the Rolling Stones or U2 or a handful of other bands. And so after 11 years, it was decided, see y'all later, everybody, you know, we need to take a hiatus from this and everybody test the waters, see what life is like and maybe, Maybe we'll get the band back together uh, somewhere down the road. And so I was living in Atlanta, Georgia, and Atlanta, Georgia was not one of the hotbeds of the music business. You know, it's it was L.A., New York, or Nashville. And I wasn't particularly, um, you know, fond or a fan of country music. And I was from New York. So... Um, I went up to New York. Michelle didn't, neither of us wanted to leave Atlanta. We loved the South at this point. We became very, very, you know, in tune with it. So I said, look, I, I'm, I'm going to go North. And um, my friend, Danny Gottlieb, who I met in college and he was the original drummer of the Pat Metheny group. He lived in New York on 23rd Street, right off 9th Avenue. I had never lived in Manhattan. I was always afraid of it because I always got picked on by New York, you know, city slicker kids. Um, and so um, Danny had just uh, uh, joined uh, a new version of the Mahavishnu Orchestra. And he said, Rod, here's the keys to my apartment. I'm going to be gone for a month. So. He let me crash at his place. And then I just started like pounding the pavement. You're like, how do you find the next thing to do? It's it's not, uh, there's no spe special set path for a musician. Like if you want to be a lawyer or a doctor, you know what you have to do. Um, in music, you just hope that you're walking down the right street at the right moment and a door is going to open. So. You know, because in, uh, in 1986, when I moved up there, I had a name of sorts. You know, I had showed up in that in the Modern Drummer polls, Best New Talent, and had been on the cover of Modern Drummer magazine. Um, it opens certain doors for you because people know who you are. 
Um, but one thing led to another, led to another, led to another. And one day I found myself in the offices of a Japanese management company that managed at the time when new age music was popular, an artist by the name of Kitaro. Um, and Kitaro was coming to the United States to do a five week tour. And uh, the plan was he was coming to New York City to find musicians for the tour. And so through some other thing I was doing, I had met the Japanese management company and they said, hey, come to our offices. We want to talk to you about doing this guitar tour. And so I went up to their offices a few days later and uh, they said, hey, we're sorry to disappoint you, but Kitaro, he flew from Japan to L.A. and he's already chosen L.A. musicians to do his tour. So sorry, but we have your name and number and we'll keep you in mind if, if any other things ever pop up. So I said, thank you. And as I was leaving their offices behind a closed door, I heard the demo of what turned out to be Madeleine, right? The the first video and single of the first Winger album. But there was no band Winger yet. Um, it was just these two guys that this Japanese management company were letting use um, an eight track reel to reel Tascam that they had. And they were trying to help these two guys to get a record deal. So, um, so the manager, he said, Hey, let me introduce you to these guys who are doing demos, opens the door and it's Kip Winger and Red Beach. And, um, the scene was really, really, uh, fascinating because Here's Reb, who is like, almost like I don't want to say quaking in his boots, but he was so excited because the drummer that was standing, you know, five feet away from him was the drummer in one of his favorite bands, uh, if not his favorite band, with his favorite guitarist, Steve Morris, right? So he says to Kip, Kip, do you know who this is? You know, oh my God, Kip, you're not going to believe. Her. Do you know who this is? You know, and Kip in his, you know, blase manner, which if you if you don't know Kip, you can mistake it for, you know. Sure. Yeah. So um, he said, hey, man, look look at Rev. He's like a girl. Like, I don't know who you are. Nice to meet you. Um, And so I said, hey, you know, uh, Dixie Dregs and Steve Morse band, they're on – hiatus until further notice. I mean, it might never, neither of those bands might ever get back together. You know, I'm looking for the next thing to do. And Reb kept saying, we're not worthy. What? This is such stupid music. Are you kidding? You know, and uh, Kip said, look, I, I mean, are you really interested? Um, and I said, I, I am. And he said, look, you know, there's like these 20 or 30 drummers that live in New York that come to every audition that happens um and that's the list of drummers that we have for the day that we get a record deal uh but if you're interested i'll put your name on the list but better yet you know reb is so excited what are you doing you know in a couple of days you want to meet it i forget what you know rehearsal studio you want to get together and jam so i said sure and so that that's how it happened but the jam and the audition itself uh, were interesting because when I walked in there, I made a point of leaving my jazz fusion chops in the hall, right? Because I didn't, I didn't want to turn Kip off. Um, and so I went in there determined to just hit the drums harder than I've ever hit them and barely play a drum fill like stupid rock drummers do. Again, that's the old me when I was a right. snob. You know, I don't think that at all anymore. I have the utmost respect uh, for all kinds of music. So, um, so Kip walks over to me. He's hovering over the drum set, and he's pumping eighth note. Right, so like, dunk, 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 like can't get enough. Dunk, 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 dunk. So I played uh, what. I call tried and true kick snare pattern number one, like the first beat 
somebody learns when they're playing the drums. Kick, snare, kick, snare, do, ba, do, ba, with as hard as I could. I didn't play a drum fill, I didn't do anything. And then Kip stopped playing and he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm playing what I think is appropriate. You're, you know, you're just pumping out the eighth notes. He goes, great, great. It sounds great. Reb said you could do weird stuff. You know, I said, really? He said, yeah, lose me. I said, you're serious? Here we go. And then we had the best time. And I just started doing crazy stuff that you do in the jazz fusion world, not in the rock world. And uh, that was a big part of the reason that I was asked um, to join the band. But I, I, I initially there wasn't a winger. It was just uh, Atlantic Records signed Kip and Reb uh, to do, you know, a record. And then I was hired as the drummer to play on the record. But I kept coming back to hang out with them during the recording and then we all started becoming friends and it was like, Hey, let's make it a band. And so by the time the record came out, winger was a band. Becomes a band. It's funny for people who don't know, Kip and Reb had spent a lot of time playing on other people's records, Atlantic records. Kip yeah. would come in and sing, Reb would come in and play a solo. And it was, I always felt like I could picture them just sitting in the lobby waiting for their call. All right, bring one of those guys that we need somebody. Uh, they played on so many, different uh, Atlantic projects. And of course, Kip played with Alice Cooper and so did Paul Taylor, who would also be involved in that lineup of Winger. But it's so interesting to see musicians knew when Winger came out, sure, maybe the teenage girls uh, uh, were, were into 17 and maybe into um, the image, but musicians knew. Um, it, it was a little bit different. It wasn't like you could just go Google people. We're looking at uh, early Winger right here. And a far cry from your look in the Dixie Dregs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot, of, obviously, a lot of hair uh, at, at this time. But I remember Madeline comes out and it plays on the Headbangers Ball, and musicians go, "Uh oh, you know, this this is for real." Um, not to disrespect other bands of that, uh, you know, peers, but they weren't doing the same thing. Reb, an incredible guitar player, Kip songwriting, bass playing, uh, everything. Um, uh, and then Paul as well. Really the band, people knew it. They knew there was something more. And what's so incredible about the first Winger record is that sure, there's weird things like Purple Haze on there. Uh, and and 17, a pop song, a, still a, an incredibly popular one. But as I was saying in my introduction, songs like Headed for a Heartbreak, your drumming um, and your choices, of, of what to play are so different than what everybody else was doing at the time. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I really, you know, tip my hat to Kip for, you know, having that uh, like vision to try to have uh, some different kinds of elements within that hairband realm, right? So to get a record deal back then, you, you, you always have to play the game to some extent and try to fit some kind of format but he also wanted to have elements that you wouldn't necessarily find in that arena which it was, was really almost like he snuck it in you know you know what i mean like okay we got the image we got the pop songs but we're going to sneak in something a little bit different that uh, and obviously as winger career progresses um that's going to change and people are going to see that that style of music not to say that Winger is a full-on prog band. There's still plenty of catchy songs, right. but um, it's it's. I, I was saying to Eddie Trunk on the cruise, we were saying, "Boy, Winger really had the last laugh." You know, for the band that people sort of made fun of, and Beavis and Butthead and Metallica, all these really silly things that come up in every interview. I find them to be so. It's so old news. Um, the the Winger's music has survived, and when people go to a Winger concert. You, yeah, you'll hear the songs that you wanted, to, the, the, the original old songs, but when people see the music and see how uh, it's progressed, I think you make new fans every time. I can't tell you how many times I've taken people to see Winger and they go, oh, you're the 17 band. Right. And I go, wait, wait do you watch this? But in the beginning, in 1988, when the first record comes out, your eyes are everywhere. You're, you're on MTV constantly. One of my earliest memories is New Year's Eve. Uh, and I'm sure you'll never forget it either. If you thought the Sex Pistols 
could have been a joke. Wait till you have to perform with Sandra Bernhardt. And you know what? Um, about how many months ago is it? Uh, not that many months ago, um, a friend of mine called me up and said, Rod, what are you doing tomorrow? I said, uh, why? What's up? He goes, I'm having lunch with Sandra Bernhardt. Um, and, um, and do you know the name Michael Alago? Michael Alago was he, you know, he, I think he signed Metallica, very big. He got a great, docu great documentary on Netflix about him. Yeah. I, I, you know what he told me? I, ha I have to see it. So I went into the city and had lunch with Sandra Bernhard, Michael Alago, and, um, and, and my, my friend uh, who used to be her trainer, you know, like a gym trainer back uh, in uh, the 90s or something, and had the best time. Had the best time with her. You know, she's a winger fan um, and a real sweetheart. Real Did sweetheart. you guys talk what? about that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had Paul on the show and he talked a little bit about it. And I believe she kind of threw songs. At, I think it was a last second thing, right? Kind of. Yeah. I, you know, drumming is the easiest of, if, if you know how to play the drums, um, you can find your way through most any song because it doesn't involve drumming chords or playing a riff uh, or singing specific lyrics. You know, so much drumming uh, in pop culture, it's the same patterns over and over with the slight variation here and there. Um, so I remember, you know, Paul had to start the song, right? You know, alone. And there, here comes the camera right on his hands on the keyboard. Uh, I, he, was a, he was a little bit nervous for that. But, I mean, think about what the drumming is. Oh, alone, you know? And so if you hit this cymbal instead of this cymbal, or you, you even do a kick that's not what's on the record, it doesn't matter because it's not melody or harmony. Right. But that, that was good. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to make you know one point going back to that first Winger album and the song 17, which is as responsible for selling us nearly 2 million albums as it was for you know the downfall of the band when that whole era came down, era went down. Um, and also all the fun that was made of our band, right? I mean, all the like the cruel jokes. It, it was always that song. It wasn't headed for a heartbreak or Madeleine. It was just the silly, insipid words to Seventeen. However, we've never in these thirty-five years ever heard one musician who can play the riff correctly. Right. On top of that, it's such a syncopated riff. You know, Kip sings on top of playing it. So now you're talking about very complex counterpoint. So it's so funny to me that something that lyrically is silly um, is... It's so complex. It's so complex musically. But the thing about that song was, so we cut the drums. I did a take. And then um, I was asked to play it again, but in those two measures after the guitar solo, when they play that riff, I mean, they said, can you do something there that you'd never hear on a rock record? Meaning, can you sort of draw from your, your schooled, jazz fusion mind and do something that rock drummers just don't do because they've never studied it. And so I said, all right, I have an idea. I think you're going to hate it. And I did what ended up on the record with, I, I don't know if you even know the part I'm talking about, but yeah, yeah. it's, so it's basically taking a groove and displacing it. And I, I did what I call, you know, groove displacement 101. Like um pa um, um pa, but I started it 
an eighth note later. So instead of um pa um um pa um pa um um pa, you have um pa um um pa um pa um um pa. Just for two measures. I can't tell you when we started touring how many uh, in the hundreds the musician fans would ask me about that. What time signature is that? What happens there? Why does it sound like the bottom drops out? I was so disoriented, blah, 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 blah. And um, that was one of the most uh, exciting um, experiences for me to keep having, where people were actually picking up on the fact that some little drum concept was being uh, utilized yeah, so it's uh, something just a little different. Something just a little different. Rod, did I did anyone ever say seventeen is a bad idea? Was there anyone who said don't do that song? Paul. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, he's wrong and right, right? I mean, he's wrong yeah. in the long run. Who knows if the band would have made it without that song? Because then we would have had Madeleine headed for a heartbreak, hungry. Um, we wouldn't have had like a, a mid tempo. Well, Madeleine was sort of, uh, you know, who's to say with anything, like would the Beatles have made it if Ringo Starr wasn't the drummer, if it was John, Paul, George, and Pete, you know, right. as in Pete, who knows? It's that lyrical thing that at the time, everything was fun and everyone was having a good time and it was okay. I had a guy on the show named Robert Tepper and he wrote a song with uh, Benny Mardones. It was a big hit song, uh, but the first lyric was, she's just 16 years old, leave her alone. The song was giant, but now it's canceled. The guy's, pa Benny's passed away since, but it's like, you can't say that. Now, wingers, you know, you still play 17, and I think it's tongue in cheek. I think uh, you have to play the hit and Kip jokes about how old she would be now. I, I, right. My math is off, but uh, pushing 50, I think. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. 52. And yeah. 52, right. Yeah. So you're, you're college educated. So, <laughs> but uh, so it's, it is, it is funny. I'm glad that, that Winger doesn't shy away from it and say, well, Beavis and Butthead and these things. No, at, at one point, Kip wanted to sell this t shirt. He did, the, the Beavis and Butthead logo, Winger version right. of Stuart War. And I think it's good to embrace it. And I think when people go see Winger, they get, um, they get to see all those different things. Now, you're touring, you go on these big tours, you play with Kiss, you're playing arenas, and uh, you're a married man at the time, but yeah. you know, but there's women and craziness. Did, did you think, to, you, you must have stopped and said, this is a far cry from playing with the Dixie Dragons. A completely different demographic. <laughs> it, it, yeah, insane. Um, but you know, from, from uh, the day, uh, you know, I set eyes on Michelle in the eighth grade. I mean, when someone told me, I heard Michelle likes you, that was it. I was just, you know, obsessed, the good kind of obsessively in love um, with this person who I, you know, you know, I, I think was a soulmate. And uh, we had the most, you know, beautiful um, love affair, you know, until her unfortunate passing, you know, from after... Uh, 22 years battling breast cancer. Uh, but, you know, um, being in a band during that time, or just in general, being in a rock rock band as, you know, like every teenage boy's uh, fantasy, because, you know, it's all true. You know what I mean? Like, uh, if, if you want to live that life, that insane, crazy, off off the cliff life, you can. Um, I just, you know, I made a decision from day one. I mean, I can't wait to experience this ride of being in a band where, I mean, at, at first, you know, uh, when it was written off, I mean, um, Madeleine didn't get ads like in the second or third or fourth week of its release. And Atlantic Records, unbeknownst to us, dropped the band. That was it. It was over. Um, but then MTV started playing the video in a medium rotation and the handful of copies that they had um, uh, manufactured sold out and then there were reorders and then, you know, then it becomes a feeding frenzy. People start calling MTV and go, no, oh, played more. Then it went from medium to heavy to extra heavy. And then all of a sudden it's like 
the snowflake that becomes an avalanche, you know, for a snowball to an avalanche. Um, but so like the ride was unbelievable. But from, from the very beginning, I said, you know what, nothing is more important to me um, than my relationship, my marriage with uh, my wife. Yeah, you, um, the, everyone in Winger was a little bit older than some of the other bands. There was guys getting signed who might have been, you know, 18 years old and, and obviously a little green. And uh, you guys, I think, were a little bit more together. That doesn't mean to say that there weren't some uh, colorful, again, personalities. Um, Kip and Reb are one of the oddest duos that you will ever see. I talked about it with Paul a little bit. Uh, my question, and I think I know the answer, was were they as was it like that then as well? Like what? Like was it like, like what? Well, how they interact with each other now—they're just such. Uh, uh, they're the odd yeah. couple. They are. They are. They're like brothers, you know. And so, like brothers, like have this kind of love-hate relationship. Um, they would do anything for each other, but they're such different people uh, that it, you know it's not always just rosy. But that's probably what makes for great chemistry in terms of the songwriting. Yeah, oh, yeah, I, I, absolutely. They definitely, they pull, they pull that together. I can tell you those, you see this all the time, but there'll be a, Kip will rent, have a rental car to go to the gig and they'll get, you guys will get to the gig and Reb will be in the passenger seat. And then Kip will decide to do donuts in the parking lot just to scare <laughs> uh, Reb, you know. Uh, and I can, I can say one of the first days we were in Milwaukee and it was snowing and you, know, you uh, uh, it seems the responsible guys drive. So you were in one car and Kip was in the other car and, uh, and Reb is sitting in the lobby and he says, I'm not going to get in the car with him in this snowstorm. And they're having this thing, but I'm sort of refereeing between them. And Kip says, well, then leave him. He could stay, you know, and now we're playing <laughs> musical cars, you know, uh, well, let him, let him ride with Rod and we'll switch John into this car. And, as you said, you can tell they love each other. Their musical bond is incredible. The way they work together um, uh, is is amazing. But they do have this thing where they pick on each other. Um, Kip can convince Reb pretty much anything. He's convinced them that there was a camera hidden in the smoke detector in his hotel room, and <laughs> and and Reb would Reb would believe it, and Kip would tell him that the front desk called and they know what you're doing in your room which would lead Reb to confess to anything that he could have possibly uh, done in his room. I leave out the colorful stories because but yeah. it, what we're saying sounds funny, but it's, it's so much more insane. Uh, and it's amazing, though, because as much as I'm joking, Winger is the only band on most of these bills that is the original lineup on the Monsters of Rock cruise. Yeah. Winger was the only band um, uh, that was all the original members still together that's not an easy thing by by any means we're going back to 1988 um, 35 years yeah yeah what do you do you have any advice for some of these bands what's the secret wow that's a great question um yeah um give each other space try to respect um like uh, what makes each personality different and individual uh, understand that you're all human beings and you have good days and bad days. And um, yeah, just like respect each other. And, it, and it's not an easy thing to do. You, uh, also, you guys didn't let substance and things like that get right. in the way where some bands um, did. I will also say that uh, to see Winger sound check is the proper way to sound check. If every right. fan would do it that way, you would save a lot of fights. Kip is the only one who speaks. And everyone, he knows what everybody wants. And it goes much faster than having everyone, no one's noodling. No, and he knows, nope. no, no noodling. And these are the parts we play. Everyone sings. We hear that. This is the part. Everyone knows what to do. And the sound checks are pretty quick and painless. Yes. Uh, yeah. Very efficient. Um, I, I can't really remember all the way back in the, in the beginning, but it's been like that for many, many years, we, we can go through it really quickly, but I, I mean, I've seen it, you know, um, you know, drummers are just nervous when they're sitting on their drums. They have to, they have to like be tapping something. Um, 
And we've just gotten it down, really. We've honed it down to a science. Um, yeah. And, but, you know, it was, uh, in, it was interesting. So, like, um, I, um, you know, so a couple of weeks, weeks ago, like, we were doing all these shows in the UK with Steel Panther. And one of those days, um, when we finished the sound check, um, you know, three of the guys left the stage, or two or three of the guys left the stage, and it wasn't yet time for doors. There were a couple of minutes. And I, I just, you know, since everything was finished, I just started playing the drums, which you never get to do. You know, our soundtracks, it's very specific. The riff of Blind Revolution, for the vocals, it's Can't Get Enough, a teeny bit ahead for a heartbreak so we can get the keyboards, and we're almost, almost done. And so I just... I couldn't believe that I couldn't remember the last time when I was pre-show on stage that I got to just jam and play drums for about five minutes. It was unbelievable. It's Years. funny how that happens. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's yeah. You you got so into that uh, that cycle. This is how we do it. That's it. And I take my sticks. So it must have been fun to play a little bit. Awesome. Yeah. And, awesome. And. Uh, so Winger runs till 93, to, uh, the, you know, the second record in The Heart of the Young. Then Pull, Pull starts to show a little bit of the difference. Actually, all the records do. And The Heart of the Young has songs as well. Yes, it has Miles Away and Can't Get Enough. But some songs like Rainbow and the Rose and things like that yeah. show a, a progression to where the band is, is going. But things change. You take uh, the Winger's going to take some time off. A lot of time off. Winger's going to be... Gonna be uh, like most bands, going to be out of it. You do other things. Um, uh, Jordan Rudis, who was uh, the keyboard player for Dream Theater, uh, amongst other things, you do the uh, Rudis Morgenstein uh, project, right? Yeah. And but, yeah, yeah. So the but the way that happened was um, in 1994, uh, the Dixie Dregs um, were doing a, a, some pretty extensive touring. I'd gotten back with the Dixie Dregs because you know, we put the band back together because now Winger wasn't um, going to be busy until further notice. And it was like nine years before we got back together to do the Poison Cinderella Faster Pussycat tour. Um, so I'm with uh, Dixie Dregs. And um, for a short period of time, uh, we needed to find a replacement keyboardist for T, Lavitz. And um, who, Jordan Rudis was like this completely unknown musician who he was famous at these music trade shows called the NAM shows because he would demo whatever keyboard company's gear uh, that he was with at the time. And he was this phenomenon that was known in NAM shows, but not uh, in your average, you know, rock and roll uh, daily life. And, uh, he came to our attention through Jan Hammer's management. Jan Hammer was the keyboardist in the Mahavishnu Orchestra. And uh, so T, uh, not T, so Jordan filled in for like 10 or 20 shows. And um, I, it's rare that you see Steve Morse laugh because he's so blown away by somebody's talent. And so Jordan had perfect pitch. He has perfect pitch. And he had learned all the, the dregs music and charted it out. And he didn't make a mistake in the one rehearsal that we did before we then played our first gig the next day. So the first show with Jordan um, was in Fort Lauderdale. And in the middle of the show, the power went out on stage with the guitar, the electric violin, and the bass. And so I'm looking at this keyboard player who I met the day before that keyboards go directly into the PA system. They're not going through an amp. So Jordan's keyboards were alive and well, as were the drums. So instead of stopping and waiting on stage for the text to fix, you know, the, uh, the power problem, this stranger and I just kept jamming for about five or 10 minutes. And it just kept getting better and better and we were so excited. So when we finished the show and we're backstage, we were talking about, oh, my God, could you believe how huge it sounded? Just keyboards and drums. We should do something together. And so that was sort of like the germ, you know, 
of the idea to uh, put together our mighty power duo called the Rudis Morgenstein Project. Yeah, and, and that ran for a while. Do you still do it or no? Um, we haven't done it in a few years. We love playing together and we love hanging out. Um, I, you know, I'll never say never, but, um, you know, I'm so busy now, certainly this what? next year, year and a half with Winger and, uh, dream theater is always busy. Yeah. Uh, jazz. And so, I, and so, yeah. Yeah. And so it's just, it warms my heart, you know, to see how Jordan went from the world's best kept keyboard secret to the world's most famous keyboard. Yeah. Secret. Uh, absolutely. Uh, jazz is dead, not just a, a a catchphrase, but a reference to the Grateful Dead. Yeah. Okay. So th this was one of the most thrilling uh, bands I've ever played in. For one, because I replaced one of my drumming idols, Billy Cobham, mm -hmm. um, and then got to play with one of my bass idols, Alfonso Johnson, who I had seen as a college student playing the group Weather Report. And then I saw him playing the Billy Cobham George Duke band. Um, and I remember like being in the audience of the, the Cobham Duke show in Atlanta, Georgia, just going watching Alfonso and just wondering what would it be like to play with somebody like that? And then, you know, fast forward, whatever, 20, 30 years, I, there he is, you know, hovering over me, his six foot four self. Um, giving me a run for my money. So um, it, T. Lavitz was the keyboardist in Jazz is Dead. Jimmy Herring uh, was the original guitarist. He now plays in Widespread Panic. And he replaced Jerry Garcia in The Grateful Dead when they reformed for a while after Jerry Garcia's um, untimely passing. Um, when I agreed to join Jazz is Dead, I said, okay, I know it's the music of the Grateful Dead, but like, tell me, like, how does it work? And uh, I forget, it was probably T who said, Rod, you're going to find out what you're made of because every show is different. We don't play the same songs night to night, just like people don't want in jam band world, right? They just, they just want you to make it up as you go along. So a song might be 15 minutes long. You'll play the head of the song, you know, like the, like verses and choruses, and then the middle of it, just see, see where it takes you. Like take chances, fall on your face, pick yourself up. Great stuff happens when you're in that environment. So Jazz is Dead uh, it was a totally different, um, you know, music experience for me because all of the other things that I do are much more controlled environments. So yeah, and wingers in in headed for a heartbreak and rainbow and the rose and in my drum cell I get to kind of do crazy weird stuff, but the majority of the time you're keeping time, right? Pounding away, moving the music forward. Even in the Dixie Dregs, which is you know in the fusion realm and and a lot of notes and really busy and different time signatures, still a lot of the approach is like um, uh, like being in an orchestral oh. environment where you're playing specific notes, specific parts. Jazz is dead. You know, if if the last time we played the song, you're playing it like this, and now you don't feel like doing that, you just, I don't know, if you want to take a bathroom break while the band is playing, just get up, leave the stage. They'll look and go, oh, I guess he went to the bathroom. They'll just keep, you know what I mean? The jam band philosophy is so different than the rest of the music business. It's you know, got to be refreshing, though, uh, you know, oh. as a player to do all these different things. And as I say, I said your career has two sides, but it has much more than that. Uh, and I think that's what keeps it, uh, like, you know, to be playing drums as long as you had, it's sure, certainly going to make it uh, still interesting. You know, it's a, uh, although you, uh, we're talking about Berkeley just a little bit, tw almost 20 years as a professor at Berkeley. On a tried and true drum method, you gave away a little bit of the first lesson earlier. I, I remember talking to you about it, and I find it really fascinating. And this also shows your different approaches to music. A great musician should be able to play all different types of song. You shouldn't be able just to do one style. And I think you have a great approach to people. Also, 
you know, the Carmine Peace book, a lot of drummers started with that book. You didn't have to be a drummer to get through the first certain amount of pages. You could learn something from it. And I feel like your course is geared towards that as well. Um, which thing I, I, feel, you... I, I feel like people don't have, to, you don't have to be an advanced drummer to start listening and paying attention to the things you teach about tried and true drum patterns. As you yeah. said earlier, some right. of them kicks in there. Um, so somebody could really learn at all levels from what, from your course. Yeah. At, right. So, um, so, uh, like 12 years ago, uh, Berkeley asked me if I'd create like the world's first online three credit college course in rock drumming. Right. So I spent the better part of a year, um, uh, formulating like what would be the best way to go about, um, you know, teaching a 12 week course. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I just thought, you know, what makes the most sense? Let's get back to the very beginning. What is it that makes rock music tick and what's at the heart and soul of it? And so in listening to about 10,000 snippets of music on iTunes to try to find, you know, 300 perfect musical examples for the different things that I was going to be um, teaching and, and talking about and demonstrating, I kept hearing a handful of the same bass drum snare patterns, whether it was music from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, or 2000s. Um, now, granted, uh, you know, music has evolved and the drumming has evolved, but the patterns in thousands and thousands and thousands of songs are the exact same patterns. And so the very first lesson, the week one lesson, is about what I call the tried and true seven kick snare patterns that you can make sound unlimited number of different ways by the way you play those kick and snare patterns and how you approach the ride pattern that goes with it. And so like once you put in the variable of the ride pattern, whether it's quarter notes, eighth notes, 16th notes, rim shots on the snare or playing regular where you're not playing the rim shot and on and on and on and on, you could sound like a thousand different drummers, but it's all um pa mm mm pa or um pa mm mm pa. It was amazing. Yeah, and the course is still available. People can still take it. Oh sure, yeah. It's and, every, uh, year, every twelve weeks, so four times a year through Berkeley's online division. Yeah, and, uh, Berkeley took a lot of your time. Obviously, you were going back. You were commuting from New York to Massachusetts and uh, and playing in rock bands and doing. Everything, yeah. you were probably the, the hardest working man for quite some time. What's uh, an interesting thing about Winger again is that uh, Alice Cooper, there's a parallel with Alice Cooper. Kip was an Alice Cooper. Rev was an Alice Cooper. Paul was an Alice Cooper. Were you ever almost in Alice Cooper? I was. They called me. Um, uh, it was probably, I'm guessing, around the year 2000 or so, maybe. And... Uh, like for various reasons, um, I didn't do it. You know, um, I, I loved uh, the thing that I had going with um, the teaching at Berkeley, and I had enough other things going on to where, like, when you commit to tour in a band, everything else has to uh, be put on the sideline. Right. Right. And uh, at that point in my life, I wasn't going out on, you know, Two month tours, like living on a tour bus. I'd already done that a bunch. Um, and, you know, with like, I mean, I was very flattered that I got the phone call to see if I'd be interested um, in playing. And then a part of me wanted to do it so that I could say, you know, every original member of Winger played in Alice Cooper's band. Yeah, you, you could have completed the. Uh, uh... The circle. Okay, let's talk uh, real quick, and then uh, we'll let you go. Uh, Winger. Here, here's a little bit of a recent look at Winger. John Roth in the band. The four are the original from the first two albums, but John comes in for pull, and he's been with the band ever since. And uh, I've had people ask me, "Well, what does he do?" They have the four guys, and uh, John is an incredible musician as well. Reb is not a selfish player. He's certainly happy with letting John shine and play as well. He sings, uh, and this band, your lineup, works incredibly well together. Yeah. Um, 
you know, a lot of bands have the unsung hero, like in Led Zeppelin, it's John Paul Jones. And in Van Halen, it was Michael Anthony, like the, the person who's spoken about the least, but probably plays like a more important role than almost anybody. That, that's, that's John Roth to me. Um, he can do everything, right? He's an amazing parts player, whether it's riff or chords, like, like perfect. He's a workhorse. He puts in more time than anybody to make sure everything that he does is spot on. And um, his vocals are, are like, you know, sensational. You see, like on the cruise, like when we do the medley, right. um, and he does the Starship song, and then you know when he sings um, um, "White Snake," the white the White Snake song. Yeah, so um, it's not very easy to find um, people who excel both on their instrument and uh, have the kind of voice that John has. He's so important to the band. And, and, and yeah, and you notice when he's not when he's not there, or someone has to sub for him. Uh, he does play with Starship as well, has a busy schedule. But yeah, yeah he's he's filled in to that band uh, uh, so well. And you have to have people who can sing. Some of these songs, I, I'm sure Kip wasn't expecting to be singing 40 years later, and so to have everybody deliver, uh, it, it really helps. So every album, Kip pretty much tells me at least, or says, this is I, I, last album, I'm probably never going to make another record or some variation of that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you've heard it uh, as well. But but then again, here's seven. And uh, people are enjoying this record. Uh, lots of videos. If it was up to Kip, you'd have a video for every song um, on the record. And, uh, and yeah. again, another a new video four comes next week. Voodoo Fire. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I think it's great, and I think it's a you know Kip was always up on what what's going on and what what can what's a good way to get music across it and, and changing with the times. Well, people watch YouTube videos probably more than they listen to uh, music. Most people probably find their music through uh, YouTube. So right. four videos. Uh, who knows when he'll stop? Every now and then he he's called me with ideas. I want to do this video, and I got this video. Um, Kip is another person. We, we we you can't say enough about his brain that is always working. Um, I, I, I've said before on the show. I think I was talking to Paul. Reb and I went to Kip's uh, house to, to work on something, and uh, he was working on a ukulele a ukulele concerto. You know, oh, yeah, uh, right. it just says that how many things Kip can do for somebody who might have took some heat back in the day. A, a, a more talented guy is hard to find. I went to San Francisco with him to see his. Um, ballet. Um, yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. He, um, he's, he has it all covered. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, with the fall of, I mean, I can't believe we're part of the hair band movement, um, but with the fall of that, you know, in the early 90s, you know, Kip was the name and face of the band. And so he really uh, took the bulk of the heat from that. I just went back to the Dixie Dregs in my fusion world. Um, but there are still so many people that think this guy is a talentless hack that because when he was lip syncing in the videos, oh, look, he's not playing the bass. Well, nobody's playing the music in the videos. You're lip syncing. Um, but Kip, Kip's having the last laugh. The fact that you and I saw the San Francisco Ballet Company dance to Ghosts, his ballet. Last year, our band and crew all sat in Symphony Hall in Nashville, listening to the Nashville Symphony play Kip Winger's Symphony Number no. One. Now he's been commissioned to write a violin concerto for the Nashville Symphony. So he's been embraced, wholly embraced by the classical music world. So he's not a rock musician that puts strings to she's only 17. I mean, this is like you go to see an orchestra playing an evening of Beethoven, Mozart, and Winger. It's, a, it's astounding, yeah. really. And, and that's also one of the reasons why he always says, oh, I don't know if I'm going to make another record or whatever, because he has so many things going through his head and so many other loves of music. But at the end of the day, you know that he loves getting on the stage with Winger, his, his brothers, and uh, 
and 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 making fans happy. You guys are going to be out there working like crazy. When I was younger, I saw mm -hmm. Winger play with Cinderella at the Nassau Coliseum, and uh, I don't know what year that was, ninety maybe. Uh, but this summer you'll be out with Tom Kiefer, and right? yeah. uh, for five or six weeks, really. Not every band does that anymore. There's a lot of the fly dates. Which do you prefer? Would you rather be on the bus or be on uh, to the fly dates? Well, um, Winger hasn't done a bus tour in 15 years. I did a bus tour when the Dixie Dregs original lineup for the first album, Free Fall, from 1977. We did a 40-year reunion in 2018. So that was a bus tour. And uh, it did okay. I, You know, part of me... I'm excited that we're going to be playing all these shows, but I have a little trepidation about bus life. I like the fly-in concept of, I don't like the fact that you have to travel, uh, you know, sometimes an entire day just to get somewhere to play. But after you do one or two or three shows, you go home for right. a few days, if not a couple of weeks. So I've, come to like that a lot um, yeah so this will be interesting to kind of see um how it goes i know reb and paul are really looking forward to it you guys are looking to test that relationship of keeping the band together you know now now yeah. you're going to throw yourselves in, i think you'll survive but you're going to throw I, yourself in some close quarters you know um it's so funny um whenever a group of in, in our case, a group of guys leave home where, you know, home is where, oh my God, right, I have the mortgage and the car payment and there's the leaky faucet and the that, but that, that, that. When you leave home, that all just becomes a, a distant memory. You're now in like rock and roll world. And uh, there is a bit of a reversion to, you know, like meaning you revert to teenagehood, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, like, like uh, you know, you, you act really stupid, and it's, it's fun. There's a very fun part of it, and fortunately, we are all still good friends. In most bands, there's usually one person who kind of ruins it, um, and and can make touring, you know, less than a good time. But in Winger, we're we're all still, you know. We we like hanging with each other. We go to meals together. It's not like, hey, see you on stage, get out of my face. We do stuff together. Yeah, yeah. No, I've seen it. I, I've gone to uh, uh, sushi with you guys where Reb uh, let the people know who are working uh, that they asked him, are you famous? Uh, and and she, the, this one young lady said, my boyfriend would know who you are. And he said, I'm the second best finger tapper in the world. And... <laughs> She went and told her boyfriend, and then you uh, said to me, who do you think is first? <laughs> and uh, and I, we, I said, I'll ask him tomorrow. And he said, oh, of course, it's Eddie Van Halen. But, uh, you know, uh, but it was those kind of conversations and the fun that everybody has with that band is, is rare. Like you say, touring with people you like, it's hard to find. But when you do... Yeah. What, what a great experience. And you're so yeah. fortunate to be having it again. Yeah. And so I, I remember like, a, you know, one of those finger tapping comments uh, many years ago where, you know, someone said, you know, Reb, uh, it's been said that you're one of the best finger tappers out there. Do you know who said that? And he went, oh, that would be me. <laughs> yeah, there's the, I, I, Reb says he's going to do the show. So hopefully... I'll get to share some uh, with him. I, I thought there's no way he would do it. He told me, of course I'll do it. And because uh, Kip even told me, I'm not sure you'll get him to do it. But uh, yeah. his stories could go. Uh, he's, he's a great storyteller as well. Rod, I want to mention before you go, rodmorgenstein.com. That's your official website. People can go and check out everything to do with you and all your tour dates, other information, tips on drums, discography. Uh, the, the, you, got a, you got this tool now, uh, the wing thing. And yeah, all yeah. The, and drummers are incredibly excited about it. Can you tell me what it is? Yeah, sure. Um, all right. So when you play drums, there are a handful of issues that come up now and then. One of the, the those issues is um, if you haven't loosened a wing nut 
on a stand in a long time, you can't do it by hand because yeah, yeah. it's it's stuck in place. And so what do most of us do? We clumsily put one drumstick on top of the wing nut and another drumstick on the bottom. And then we start cranking to the left to loosen it and it slips off and then you hurt your fingers and then you hit yourself in the head. Uh, oh, that, look at that. That's one of them. And so, you know, for years, I've had this idea like to have survival drummer tools. And um, several years ago, uh, when I, I was having a really delicious Thai dinner with a friend who actually we met when he would fly from Michigan to New York when Michelle and I first moved back and I was giving drum lessons at the Drummers Collective in New York City. He would fly in every couple of weeks for for lessons. You know, he's a successful businessman, um, also a drummer. And uh, so he came to a show that we were doing near Pittsburgh four years ago, I think, but he came in the day before because we had a day off. We went to dinner and I ran this idea by him at the dinner. And, you know, like when someone, when their brain kind of stops and goes, wait, say that again, what are you talking about? That started uh, like the seed for our company. And uh, the idea is to periodically come out with, you know, one of a kind drum tools that don't look like anything that exists that um, can really help drummers with these problems that we all have. Another, another big uh, problem with the wing nuts is, so you have a hi-hat. So what happens is you put the top cymbal on and then with the wing nut, you tighten it, right? And so with your foot, you're going <laughs> But usually what happens over time is the top cymbal keeps inching its way up the run is like, oh, I'm going to lose. So then you have to loosen it. And with the drumsticks, it comes, whatever. This, I knew as soon as we brought this to the market that every drummer would be, you know, really excited about it. Because it solves a major problem that everyone who plays drums has. Well, and I saw, uh, you know, on social media, every drummer in every band sharing it, you know, because they finally, this is something that I need. So I wanted to make sure I mentioned that because I know a lot of drummers watching. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. So um, people, you can read about it if you go to MorgansteinTool.com or WingThingTool.com. So we're, it's just getting started. Um, you know, the few hundred copies that, a uh, copy, few hundred pieces that we had manufactured are already gone. And so now we're already like, you know, the new growing company with its growing pains. Um, good problem to have. It's a good problem to have. Yeah. yeah. I'll have yeah. links in the description so anyone watching who's interested can go in and click on it. Winger the band as well. Go catch Winger out on the road uh, this summer. Winger 7, wherever music's available. Rod, thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you out on the road this summer. Can't wait to see you, Jason. And it was great to see you on the cruise. And like, you are a fantastic interviewer. Well, I appreciate that very much. Yeah, I'm not blowing you. smoke. I mean, like, yeah, you have a lot of interesting things to say. And then the way you pose questions is really I good. I appreciate that. I think the hardest thing is interviews where you get people who uh, do the same interview. A lot of these stories you've told before. And so, uh, you know, we, we try to have a good conversation. It's also easy when you have a good subject and somebody who's had such a, a great life. And as I said in the beginning, uh, such a kind person. So thank you again, Rod, okay. and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Everyone, uh, make sure you subscribe, and we'll see you again 